Well, it is good to be together today, good to be gathered together to worship, to, uh, to celebrate the Lord's Supper together, to study together as well, and just be encouraged by one another. I hope that, I hope that you uh, feel welcome today. I want to welcome anyone who might be a new guest today. Um, also, this is great to have a, a large group of middle school students, so uh, great job. Yes. Can we just... <clears throat> They're headed to their youth group, so... Anyway, I um, want to welcome also university students. I know that this weekend and next weekend we may have a, a group of freshmen and returning students coming back to town and families dropping them off. So if you are a part of that group, glad to have you here today. Uh, I'm grateful that you're joining us. Um, this is our third week out in our space here in the gym. Uh, we're demoing and going to be renovating our auditorium out there. So we're going to be out here as, as long as it takes. But uh, plenty of space, room to grow. So Invite friends, invite family. Would love to have, uh, would love to have more people to fill up this space, and, and we'll go from there. I've got a few announcements. I don't do this every week, but it felt like there's a lot going on and coming up, and wanted to make sure you're aware of that. Uh, first of all, today at two o'clock, our middle school and high school students are going to be going to Highline Lake for the afternoon. So they'll meet here at two o'clock, and we'll be back here about eight o'clock. We're going to carpool out there. So if you want to tag along as a parent, you're welcome to do so. We're going to have a cookout out there and, and provide all of that, but please bring a side item. Families and students. So any, any families, any students, next Saturday, August 20th, we're going to have a family swim at Lincoln Park Pool. We'll be out there from 4 to 7 p.m., and we're going to provide pizza and drinks. Uh, just want to have you come and join us for that. Ladies, there's two events coming up. First of all, on, on Saturday, August 27th at 5.30 p.m., our ladies are going to be getting together for dinner at the warehouse and would love to have you join, uh, join them. And then a few days later, on Wednesday, August 31st, our senior ladies, anyone 50 and older, want to invite you here to the church for a luncheon that day at noon. University students, FCA huddles are starting up very soon. The last Monday of this month, August 29th, we'll be here in the building, so would love to invite you to be a part of that. And two more things, group leaders. Any of you small group leaders or interested in being a small group leader, we're gonna have a meal together on Thursday night, September 8th at 6 p.m. Uh, Zach will be in the back to answer any questions that you might have by Connect Central, help you get signed up for that. Again, group leaders, or if you are at all interested in leading a Bible study here at the church, a small group Bible study, would love to have you join us for that evening. Finally, last one. All church, everybody included, we're going to be doing some meal packing for the people of Ukraine. This will be on Saturday morning, September 17th at 10 a.m. here in this space. We're trying to pack 10,000 meals for, for that initiative. We're partnering with Lifeline Ministries. Uh, it's been organized by our mission team, so we'd love to invite anyone and everyone to be a part of that. 10,000 meals is a lot, but I'm told with the right amount of people, it can go quite fast. So please make, make plans to be here if you don't have uh, some commitment that morning. Uh, today we're continuing our series called BFFs, which if you don't know what that means, it just simply means best friends forever. And we're talking about life lessons from some of, Bible's, some of the Bible's best friends. Last week we talked about David and Jonathan. If you missed that message, it's on our website. I'd love to have you uh, check that out. Today we're going to be in Daniel chapter 3, looking at some friendships. And then next week we'll be looking at the story of Naomi and Ruth. But good godly friends, good godly friends are God's gift to us. If you have good godly friends in your life that encourage you, that you can live life with, you go through the, the valleys and the victories, the highs and the lows, you know what it's like to have good godly friends around you to encourage you. Um, that's a gift from God. The friends that we're going to be talking about today, you, you, they're, they're always together in Scripture. In fact, they're only together in Scripture. You'll never hear a sermon taught about one of them by themselves. They're always and only taught about together. You might even call them sidekicks. In Daniel chapter 3, the story we're going to look at involves three guys, three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And their story really brings about one of the most iconic moments that's been recorded for us in Scripture. There are many different lessons that you could learn from their story. Today, I want to focus on the courage that they have, and I believe it's courage that they have simply because they were godly friends together. When everybody else bowed down, they stood. 
They stood no matter what the cost. When everyone else was, was not willing to stand, they stood. Their courage is worth teaching on. Now, the world that we live in today, there are constantly social and biblical tensions that exist. The world wants to pull one way, and Bible teaching, Scripture, God's way, God's will, pulls another direction. And so there's always tension that's taking place. And sometimes the tension between what's going on in society and the tension for God's values and God's way is it might seem unbearable. But I believe that when we have godly friends around us who are encouraging us, it can be a little easier, a little bit more easy to, uh, to withstand, to continue to be steadfast. In fact, that's the big idea today. Godly friends bring out godliness. Godly friends bring out godliness. We are better together. When we surround ourselves by fellow believers, people who follow after Jesus with their life, we can more easily look adversity in the eye and endure. But if that's, if that's possible, that with godly friends around us it helps, if that's probable, if that's true, then I think there's something else we need to acknowledge. We are not meant to live this life alone. We're not meant, God did not create us to live life alone. I know many times we might think so, well, I'm, I'm, I'm okay alone. You might be okay alone, but you're not going to be in a great spot alone. God did not create us to live life alone. He created us to live life in community with one another, dependent on Him for our strength, and also dependent on godly people around us for strength as well. So the godly friends that we're going to look at today, Daniel chapter 3. I want to show you, first of all, geographically, this is kind of what's going on. The king of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, he has conquered Judah, and Judah is over here on the left-hand side, just marked by the big red star, and he has taken people, now that he's conquered Judah, he has taken people over to Babylon, way on the other side. I know that looks kind of like a flight plan, but it's as best as I could do to kind of follow the river basin, which is what they most likely would have done as they marched these people, carted these people off to Babylon. This is a vicious king. He, He wasn't stupid, he was a vicious king, and so what he does when he conquers them is he carts off, takes off these people who will now be exiled, some of the smartest, some of the brightest, some of the strongest, the most best looking. And our friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they fit the bill. So for a couple reasons, or a couple years, a couple seasons, they're going to be under the king's leadership and training, teaching them the ways of Babylon. Well, because of these guys' friendship with another man by the name of Daniel, in fact, the book is written by his name, the prophet Daniel, you can read about their friendship that leads up to this point in Daniel chapter 1 and Daniel chapter 2. But because of their friendship together, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego found themselves in a pretty good spot, all things considered. Yes, they're still exiled, but they're in a pretty good spot. They've been captured and carted back to Babylon. They're away from their home country, but pretty good situation. Even though they're in this favorable position, though, we need to remember they're in this foreign land and they're, well, their religious freedoms are are getting ready to be hindered pretty fast, or at least attempted to be. There are people there that don't want anything to do with God. There are people there that don't even recognize their God, and so they're living in Babylon, and no one else really has any interest in the one true God. Babylon is idol-driven. There are many gods. They're polytheistic. Some of their gods are people. Some of their gods are kings. Some of their gods are things. Some of their gods are myths. Babylon is full of different idols. Now today, today for us, I think we could simply define an idol this way. An idol is something of more value to me than God. Something of more value to me than God. Now when we think about an idol, I'm guessing we might picture in our minds something, you know, like small gold or some other type of shiny metallic, maybe something we've seen in an Indiana Jones type of a movie, but you know, a small gold object. That's, you know, that happens in foreign lands in times gone by. What I want us to remember, though, is there might be a little bit more in common with Babylon for us than we like to admit at times. Now, at first, it seems a little bit barbaric, right? Like, who does that? Who, who gives so much power and authority in your life to, you know, I I mean, a small, like, expensive, shiny object. I mean, who does that, right? I mean, some of you, good, I'm glad you're with me today. But (laughs) who does that? 
But then I realized, you know, it, it might be gold and metallic for them. It might be green paper for us. It might be a, a temple. It might be a, a, a king for them. But maybe for us, it's a politician or a celebrity or a stadium that we pour into. Before we think that Babylon is a distant past and distant people and that we don't have to worry about idols here and now, I want us to very clearly remember idols today are just as much idols as they were back then. The context has changed, but the problem of idolatry and the problem of idols still exists today. Uh, Babylon is probably a place that I share an idol or two with at times. Here's another truth about idols. Idols demand submission. Idols always demand submission. There's something that overpromises and underdelivers, if at all. Something that seems good, but what the enemy does is he rips away the reward and he leaves us with the emptiness left over. Idols, every single time, they demand my submission. Now, in the text today, our friends are feeling this social tension with God's values and God's ways. They're feeling that tension. So we feel that tension at times. What do we do? What do I do when everyone else caves to an idol? When majority rules, but majority isn't following the rules of God, what do we do? Where where does that leave us? Where does that put us? When everybody else bows down, how do I stand? How do you stand? What do we do? Here's a helpful thing. Here's a truth, in fact. Who my friends are will show you who my God is. What do we do in those moments? Well, one thing I can tell you is when you have good friends around you, it can help you to make the right choice. Who my friends are will show you who my God is. The people that are closest to me, the people that I have allowed in to be close to me, the people I've invited to be friends with, that have developed friendships with, whatever it may look like for you, that will tell you who my God is. They will absolutely talk about my character. They will speak to others about what I value or what I follow or what I don't follow, who my God is or who my God is not. And the fight that our friends are in together, it gets ramped up this way. Let's get into the text, Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide. And he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now this image of gold, it may have actually looked something like this on the screen on the left-hand side there. And the king has got to be proud of this statue. I mean, it's huge. Now, there are several different accounts of what it may have looked like. This is just one artist's rendition that it looked like the king of Babylon himself. Or maybe it looked like, excuse me, maybe it looked like one of the other gods that they worshipped. I'll tell you the dimensions, you know, 1 to 10, 9 feet by 90 feet. That's, that's a little odd to be a person, to be a human being, unless it's talking about the base, maybe the feet, the base of the feet was 9 feet, and then it's 90 feet tall. Otherwise, it seems like odd dimensions for a human being. Either way, the king didn't want anybody to miss it. You're going to see the groundbreaking. You're going to see this thing stood up or constructed in place. You're not going to be able to miss this idol. You're going to have to deal with this idol. You're going to have to reconcile with this idol. Now, that's not good news. But things are going to get worse before they get better. Verse 4. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, Nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. So you can feel the tension there. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold, that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. So first we have the idol, we have, we have the thing. Second, you can feel the social pressure building. Every one of you must do this. This is what the world is commanding you to do. And then we also have the, the punishment. If you don't do it, This is what's going to happen. And so in this moment, everyone's waiting. The idol is waiting. The king is waiting. The people are waiting. And then the music plays. And everyone, almost everyone, hits the floor, crumbles to pressure. And my first thought when I read this story, you know, I know the rest of the story, and most of you, many of you do too, but my first thought is cowards. I mean, cowards, don't you people, you exiles, don't you remember what God has done for you? Don't you remember all the good things that he has done for you? And the music plays and you bow down, 
cowards. But then I'm, I'm prompted by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes I feel if we're not careful, we're going to find ourselves a lot like Babylon. Somebody says, do this, do that, and so we do this, so we do that, and the music plays, and all of a sudden, we're bowing down. Somebody says to, and so we do. If we're not careful in life, we may drift. Years ago, uh, my wife and I were visiting a, a church up in Warrenton, Oregon, up near the coast, northwest. Uh, they were a partnership with our ministry in Mexico that we we're a part of, so we were visiting them for a weekend and took a few extra days to kind of look around, that sort of thing. But we stayed with this family, and I grew up in Kansas, and so I'm always intrigued, interested to hear about, you know, growing up in other parts of the country or living in other parts of the country or the world. And this guy, now, his profession was, he actually taught uh, uh, Coast Guard and other government agencies how to navigate by the stars. That was his full-time uh, profession. But when he was a teenager growing up, he and his dad built a sailboat together. And then when he was old enough, he got on the boat and he sailed it to Hawaii, where he lived for several years. Lived in the docks, worked on other people's boats to sustain himself. He met a woman, they got married, they had a child. Eventually they sailed back to, back to Oregon. And I asked him, what, what's it like, you know, making your own boat, sailing it from Oregon to Hawaii? That seems like a big deal, like, I mean, a long trip. What, what do you do? He said, well, one thing is you don't fall asleep. <laughs> when you're alone on the boat, you, you, on a trip like that, you don't just, you know, partway between Oregon and Hawaii decide we're going to stop at an island somewhere. I mean, if you've checked your geography lately, there's nowhere to stop. You don't drop anchor. You, you figure out a way to stay awake for that journey. He said it's a whole lot easier when you've got somebody with you because if you are by yourself and you fall asleep at night, you're going to wake up in the morning and have drifted way off course. But here's the thing, none of us ever wake up in the morning and just have drifted way off course. Nobody just wakes up in the morning completely lost. It always begins with small decisions, slow, small decisions, and one decision after another, and we begin to drift and we end up lost. So I ask the question, do you find yourselves from time to time adhering to the majority? Just okay with what everybody else is doing. It's difficult at times. It's hard to be, you know, out there away from the majority. It's hard to stand when everybody else is bowing down. And King Nebuchadnezzar says, jump, and it's if the people say, how high? Verse 12. But there are some Jews whom you've set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. So somebody's tattling on them now. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And again, they're in this position because of their, you know, their skills and their, their uh, example of having led well. So they've been given some authority in the area. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you've set up. So our friends stood up. The music played. Everybody else bows down. And they're the, left there standing. And people tattled on them. People ratted them out. Here, here's the thing, people notice courage, don't they? They notice when you stand alone. They don't always like different. And so they're putting the pressure on you to not be different because they don't want to feel like we're not in pace together, right? I mean, majority likes the majority to be together. That's just the way the world works. And I wonder sometimes, I wonder sometimes if we're sometimes quiet about the things of Jesus because of this. You know, when you follow Jesus, you're going to stand out. There's a clear calling on each and every one of us in Scripture that every single day when you get up, there, there ought to be a difference in your life. There ought to be a difference from who you were the day before, but there clearly ought to be a difference between you and the way of the world. There ought to be a difference between you and the place that, the people that work at the place that you work at. There ought to be a difference between you and the people you sit near at the restaurant. There ought to be a, a difference between you and the, the people around you and the way you raise your kids. That you'd be different. You're going to be different. You're going to, be, you're going to stand out. So when you are commanded to bow and you decide to stand, people are going to notice and many of them are not going to like it. Some may be angry. Some may unfriend you. Culture may try to cancel you. 
People may gossip about you. They're not going to come to the holiday party anymore. They're, they're going to try continually, probably, to get you to bow down with them. But when you have godly friends around you, you can better take the heat. You can better endure. As the heat beats down on you and you have godly friends on your left and on your right, you can better handle that. They can be encouraging you and you encouraging them. Hey, we can be courageous in this. We can do the hard right thing. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17, King Solomon recorded these words. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And many of us are familiar with that verse. We, we know what that means. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. One, we make each other better. We're, we're always refining each other. This verse is saying that we get better in the presence of godly people. When we follow Jesus with our life, and we surround ourselves with people who follow Jesus with their life, we get better together. In fact, when the people of God get with the people of God, we become more like the people of God. I think there's a truth there. There's something about being in the presence of God that impacts us for the better, and godly people sharpen us. When we're under pressure, when we're under fire, we can... We can look at our believing friends and say to one another, hey, everyone else is going that way, but I know God is calling me this way. We can stand firm. It emboldens us and sharpens us. It stretches us. It pushes us. You know, that proverb is, is good and all. Proverbs 27 or 17, you know, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. That, that's great. It's got a good ring to it. That's what we need to do. But in this moment, I need you to hear me very clearly, and you know this intuitively. This story in Daniel chapter 3, as they are faced with this decision, this is not creative story hour. This is not fiction. These guys are facing imminent death with this decision. I mean, today we're on the other end of the story. We can read the rest of it, and we're familiar with it, and we know that things end well for them. Praise God. But in that moment, for these three men, they're standing in a big question mark. Like, God, we know what we're supposed to do, what you've called us to do. We don't know how this ends. We we can't today, we can't see the furnace. I'm not in Babylon in Daniel chapter 3. But as I read the story, we need to understand the furnace is real and the furnace is hot. And these guys are facing imminent death. But they continue courageous. In Daniel 3, all the odds are stacked against our friends, right? I mean, they're standing there, maybe even talking to one another. Hey, you know what's going to happen, right? Yeah, I I know what's going to happen. You know what's been warned. Yeah, I know what's been warned. I, I think they're probably having those thoughts. They're facing imminent certain death the odds are stacked against them but but things are well God's going to show up they turned and looked at one another I imagine something along these lines you know the, the cost is high but the cause is worthy the cost is high but the cause is worthy and I think this is what God calls us into Yes, the cost may be high, but the cause is worthy. The bar gets set high, but the thing that we're fighting for or standing for or standing firm on is absolutely worthy. Now, we have to know that talking about friendship and having friends around us, that doesn't, it doesn't take the fear away. It doesn't take the difficulty or the loss or the hurt or the confusion away. But what it does do is with godly friends around us, it allows us to better stand firm, to courageously do the hard right thing. You know, I think about their courage standing in that moment, and I want to make this argument. We should feel the tension too. Like in life, we should feel the tension of, man, the world is calling me this way, but I know God is calling me that way. The world is telling me to bow down, but I know God is telling me to stand firm. We should feel the tension too. We should feel the nudge or the tug. I mean, we should feel that too. If you're a believer, for for some time, any time at all, I want to make the argument that you've probably been feeling that tension from time to time. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ and His Holy Spirit dwells within you, you have felt the tension that I'm talking about between everybody going one way and the Lord wanting us to go a different direction. That's a tension that believers are constantly in. And it is hard to stand especially with these guys knowing there are ramifications. 
You know, it's hard to, you know, stand and, and not have any idea what the number one show is on Netflix or Prime, but you know it's not God-honoring, or to not have any idea what the newest hit in music is on, on the radio or on Spotify, but you know it's probably not God-honoring, because if, if God is all he says he is, and if I'm following Jesus with my life, I mean, everything else is going to take care of itself. I'll be okay. It's hard, though, to not be the, only, well, the, to be the only person that doesn't show up to the party. Or it's hard to be the person who watches their mouth when nobody else is. Or to think about how we dress and present ourselves. To think about how we spend our money. It's difficult to do those things. To do the godly thing. But it's so much easier when we have godly friends around us. Imagine if they had just simply said, well, everybody else is doing it. Hey, guys, I mean, everybody else is doing it, so let's, let's join in. That's such a childish argument, by the way. That's what our kids say to us. Well, I mean, okay, everybody jumps off a cliff. You're going to do that, too. I mean, I know that one's been around forever, but I think God has, I believe that God has very little interest on what goes on out in those situations and much more interest on what goes on in my heart and in my mind. Is much more interest in what's going on in your heart and in your mind than at those events or activities that we would be right and noble and stand for what's true. I know it's hard to do the right thing. It's especially hard to do the right thing when few are doing the right thing, when nobody else in your office follows Jesus and comes to church on the weekends and you hear about all their other activities instead. It's hard to do the right thing when no one else in your family gets up early in the morning to spend some time in community with God and reading scripture and praying, it's hard to do the right thing when you may not have a good example in your your family life. It's hard to do the right thing sometimes. And I I know, you know, we're a church community and and we're constantly saying, hey, we need some more volunteers. And if, if you're alone, it's hard to do the right thing. And we may say, hey, we're raising money for this initiative and it's, if, if finances are tight, it's hard to do the right thing if you're alone. And hey, we're, we're starting up small groups again, and we want you to be a part of that, and we need some leaders, and it's hard to do the right thing at times. It's hard to do what maybe few are doing. It's a lot easier when we have godly friends around us, believing friends around us. I'm going to put an example out there. Maybe this will connect with you. Maybe it won't. One of the more difficult things, I think, in life from a practical stance is Long distance running. Now, maybe you would argue with that. No, I love to run. Um, I, I, I can't think of a Saturday night where I was like, you know, I think I'm going to go for a run. I would love that right now. Um, long distance running, I, I think, is one of the more difficult things that we do. I don't run necessarily because it's fun, but I run because I hope and help and think that it will help me to get in shape and once I'm in shape, maybe to stay in shape. I know that running is good for me, but I don't really like running. I know it will help me reach my goals, but I don't really like running. Now, if you can agree with that, then I've got a, I've got a Bible verse for you today. Proverbs 28, verse 1 says, the wicked run when no one is chasing them. So, so freebie for you if you ever need to go. You know, we want to teach scripture here. So if you, uh, just saying, the wicked run when no one is chasing them. But a few months back, I traveled over to Colorado Springs to Fort Carson with four others from church uh, with Derek and Zach and Matt and my son Jacob and the five of us com- com- competed in, uh, that's a strong word, we completed a, uh, a, a 10K run, six point something miles with 29 obstacles. And I will tell you, uh, Derek competed for sure and uh, Matt and Jacob and Zach were all you know, trying and striving and that sort of thing. I was like just trying to finish, you know? There were people there, though, where they were excited. They were yelling and hollering and pumping themselves up. And at the obstacles, they were, they were just crushing it. And then there was me that was just trying to get to the finish line, you know? Um, I think long distance running and then you throw in obstacles and things, I think that is some of the more difficult things that we can do. But when we have friends together, like I was there with four good friends. You know, when you have friends around you, it spurs you on. And when you train with friends, you get better and you get faster. In fact, I can run with, I can run with a friend out of the lunch loops and I will run faster than I do alone. I can run with my eight-year-old border collie and I will run faster than when I want to run alone. 
There's just something about being around friends that it gets better and you get faster and you get stronger. And again, I will tell you, I don't like to run. And I don't like to be told how to run or to run faster. But that's what happens. I'm out there running and so, hey, you've got more in your tank. You can go. Keep going. You know, we spur each other on. Now that said, some of us in church today, I think that we might have stepped back from some friendships, maybe intentionally, maybe unintentionally. We might have distanced ourselves from some good, godly friends. Maybe we've stepped back from a small group or serve team or, or maybe just meeting with a godly friend. And, and I, I, I don't want to step on toes too much. But I think sometimes it's because we don't like being told how to run. We don't like being spurred on. We don't like being called out. Good godly friends will sharpen one another. We will help each other. When we know one another is struggling, we will call out those things in a loving way. Here's another truth today. Who you run with determines where you end up. Who you run with determines where you end up. It's also been said, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Who you run with determines where you end up. The type of people that I surround myself with, they'll they'll show you what I'm up to. They'll talk about what my values are. They're going to show you where I'll end up. Our godly friends, well, our friends do one of two things. Our friends either, either urge us in chasing after Jesus or they're pulling us from chasing after Jesus. There is no in between. That's what friends do. They're either pushing us towards chasing Jesus or pulling us back from chasing Jesus. So who, who, who are your friends? What type of friends do you have? You know, we have a God who I believe desires to have community with us, be in community with us. And I believe he's a God who wants us to be surrounded by good, godly friends, people who care for you like he does. Friends that seek justice and love mercy and also walk humbly with their God. People who honor truth, people that pursue him. That we'd be surrounded with those kinds of people. When we run with those kinds of people, we can better endure temptation. There's a better chance that a marriage struggle can get more quickly resolved. There's a better chance that friendships can get reconciled. When we run with godly people, we can better endure loss and walk through grief and stand against social pressures. When we run with good godly friends, all the more confidently we can stand and be faithful where God has called us to stand. Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you've set up. They have so much confidence in their God that they explain to the most powerful man in the area at that time, hey, my God speaks for himself and I'm with him. You're not my God. That idol is not my God. I believe that my God can. I believe that my God will. And you know, we can, we can make this personal. That person who failed you, they're not God. That job that you didn't get, that's not God. The job that you did get, or the raise or the promotion that you did get, or didn't get, that's not God. The game that you won, that's not God. The test that you took, that's not God. So what the believers have to do in that moment is turn to that item like our friends did and say, that's not God. I'm not going to honor you like that. No matter no matter the cost, no matter death or sh- shame. And the king is not thrilled about this. In fact, he immediately has the furnace turned up times seven. He did seven times as hot. Verse 21. So these men wearing their robes, trousers, these men being Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace is so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who, lo- who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. This should be the end. 
They're courageous. They're valiant. But this should be the end. Into the fire they went. I mean, this should be the end. They stood up for the right thing. Hey, that's noble. It should be the end. But God is always leaving room, right? I mean, it seems like God is always leaving room. A moment that seems grim, a moment that seems finished, a moment that seems hopeless, this should be the end. But God, and I think it's in those but God moments that he is most glorified. Like, God, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know what you've called me to, so we're going to step into it. And God, we really hope you show up. If you don't, okay, but we really hope you show up. And I think in those moments is where God gets the most glory. Not because the situation was good, but because he is good. Verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement. He asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Now that fire, I mean, that could represent many things in your life. But you don't have to walk through the furnace alone. God is with you. He is the get into the fire with you kind of God. And this church has people here who are get into the fire with you type of people who want to be friends with you, who want to be good, godly friends and influence in your life. Now we can know this in our darkest moments, in our most difficult moments, in the moments where we're under fire, God walks with us. His son is not on the cross or in the tomb anymore. God sent him here, sent Jesus here to give his life, to pay for your sin, to sacrifice his life, For your sin and my sin. And he was dead and buried. And God raised him back to life again. Defeating sin and death. A truth that was foretold in scripture. And he's done that so that you can be made right with him. So that you don't ever have to be alone. And maybe it's possible in weeks, months, years past. Maybe, maybe we've missed some of these miracles. We've looked at the furnace and said, no way. But I believe that with the power of godly friends around us, we can stand firm. And we can face whatever the world may send our way. We can stand firm on what God has called us to. Verse 26. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace. He shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. It's not just an isolated miracle anymore. Other people are taking notice. In fact, because of their standing firm and being faithful, they have now gained the attention of the most powerful man in the area, one of the most ruthless kings on the planet at the time. And because of that, I can say that our courage counts. Your courage matters. And it'll be much easier to stand firm when you have godly friends around you. Now, when we stand... Let's make sure that we're pointing to Jesus. And who more noble to point to? Again, who took our sin on the cross, who gave his life for all, that anyone who would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. Let's point to Jesus. We don't have to be alone anymore. God can be with us. As Erica said, he wants to be in friendship with us, in community with us. Here's the rest of the story, final verse here 26 and 27 so Shadrach Meshach and Abednego came out of the fire and the satraps prefects governors and royal advisors all the government leaders crowded around them they saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies nor was a hair of their head singed their robes were not scorched and there was no smell of fire on them you know God does not promise us that we will you know live a life without difficulty without danger without a furnace without tragedy without loss. God doesn't make any of those promises. In fact, we're actually promised those types of things will happen to us. But he does promise that he will be with us in every situation, every season, every difficulty, every danger, every furnace, every fire. And I want to believe that those Christian godly friends that you 
have around you or are trying to surround yourself with, I, I want to believe that they will be there with you as well. Let me pray for us. Father, we're grateful for the day. I'm grateful for the opportunity to gather and to worship. Lord, help us as we leave here to be these types of friends, that we would encourage one another, that we would help sharpen one another, that we would be there in the fire for one another. Father, help us to not be too prideful to let people close. Help us to seek out godly friends with those around us, maybe here in this church or somewhere else in this valley. But Father, help us to be good, godly friends with one another. That Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's example of standing firm when everyone bowed down, that we would be those type of followers. Father, help us to uh, honor you with our day. Please forgive us when we fail you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I hope you have a great week. Again, next week, we'll be looking at Naomi and Ruth and their story as we wrap up this series. Take care. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had no